So today I want to talk about GIS data in general and um, in the last videos I talked about where you can find it but now I want to talk about what does it look like and how do we use it and just in real you know mile high concepts about this and uh, whenever we look at GIS data there's two general models out there there's the vector model and there's the raster model there's some newer models coming out like triangulated regular networks or even uh, meshes uh, or point clouds and so forth but in general they kind of come down to these two two classes vectors or rasters and what we're trying to do in the world is we're trying to take this complex globe that we have of all this uh, amazing things that are happening on it and we're trying to uh, simplify that into something that could be used in a computer system and so whenever we simplify that out um, we can either generalize that information up into uh, into cells into little pixels and make that into a raster or we can generalize that out into points lines and polygons and have that as a vector and those uh, different ways that we generalize them we can generalize them into layers and when we combine those layers that's when we start seeing ourselves in a geographic information system so just remember there's two basic types of data models the raster model and the vector model and we're going to go into those right now on the, in more more detail but in the past there's also been two kinds of GIS's there's been raster GIS and vector GIS this is much like in the creative applications um, Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator. Illustrator is for vectors and Photoshop is for rasters. Um, you can draw a line in Photoshop um, but it's just better designed for rasters. And the same thing with Illustrator, you can you can put in a, a raster, a picture, but it's better designed for making points, lines, and polygons. In GIS we're seeing that we saw a convergence between these two types of GIS. So current modern day GIS is are typically just as good in rasters as in vectors but you do see some of the specialized platforms being a little bit better in one or the other um, so let's talk about uh, raster GIS so rasters are just a array of grid cells so you have here a bunch of pixels that's what each cell is called and then in each uh, that's what each one of these uh, cells right here are called are pixels and they're just arrayed they're just put into an uh, order uh, and they have to fall into a rectangular shape. Um, pixel means a picture element and uh, the types of raster GIS's that handle this um, today you can think of Idrisi, Erdos, Grass, these are typically remote sensing um, GIS uh, products. Um, one of the more famous types, let's see for an example of raster data, one of the most famous types is a digital elevation model, a DEM and so um, this is an acronym that you should just know off the top of your head DEM digital elevation model uh, if you're working in GIS and what is interesting here you know we've all worked with rasters before every time you've pulled out your your uh, cell phone and or your mobile phone your smartphone and took a picture with it uh, that you generated a raster image and those are you know that's why whenever you zoom in on you see pixelation those JPEGs are raster images. What we're doing is we're storing in uh, intensities of light and that's what we use to see what's going on on the screen. What we've done in GIS is pretty interesting. For example, here with the digital elevation model, instead of storing intensities of light, of red, green, and blue light, what we store is intensities of elevation. And so you can start seeing here, each one of these pixels are representing an elevation. Here being zero, uh, that's gonna be the lowest elevation and here 600 being the highest elevation. So if I wanted to start doing some analysis with this, I could start saying, wow, look, water would flow from high to low. So I'd expect the water to flow down here. You know, I would get some tributaries coming in. Well, here's a, a ridge here, so it would go this way. And so you can actually start making um, even stream networks in this in this elevation model. So there's a lot of analysis that you can do with these raster, raster um, images that's pretty cool. Um, you can represent the real world with raster GIS. So here is a hypothetical lake with a road and a, and a kind of a, a, a area, grassy area around it, foresty area. Um, what in raster, what I would do is instead of representing um, each pixel as a color, uh, as an intensity of light, I just represent it as a number. And then I can colorize the numbers whenever I want. So here, for example, the road, I might give it category one and then one would be red and so each one of these pixels now are going to be categorized as one and then red and then two would be water and so that's where you can hear the blue for the water I just I would just 
say number two now showed on my screen as blue. And so I actually use this raster models even to represent all different types of uh, things on the Earth besides just taking you know an aerial image or a satellite image. Uh, I can actually store categorical data or even uh, things like elevation data. Um, one thing though, one caveat with the raster GIS you got to keep in mind is that raster um, GIS uh, that each cell is homogeneous. So since that homogeneous means that everything is the same within that cell. So every one of these little pixels here is exactly the you know same value. Is that true? Is that how actually the real world is? Can I draw a square on the surface of the earth and say up oh, everything underneath that's a tree, up oh, everything underneath that's water. No, in reality it's much different than that. We have some you know different types of things happening and depending on the cell size you, you get you can actually get some very different results. So like here for example think about that look at this thing that we're calling a mixel. this is just a made up word but uh, basically the this is what's going on in the world okay underneath and then we draw these uh, four uh, quadrants or these pixels on it and now we got to go and classify each one of these quadrants based on what's going on underneath it well look here well okay what's going on underneath well I only store one value what am I gonna store well let's store this yellow beige color okay well I only store one value here what can I store mm, I don't know let's go with purple how am I deciding this I can decide this through different types of generalization but the big idea here is that you have a more complex world underneath this pixel than what we're seeing. So just keep that in mind whenever you're doing your raster analysis. But whenever we start generalizing, we can even get different results based off of which kind of rules do we use. Do we use the majority, the largest share of the pixel becomes the classification, or do we use a central point? If we use a central point, uh, we're just gonna go sample the middle of each one of these points, and then boom, 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 we're gonna have here this. What's interesting is that in this pixel right here, you have a difference between central point and largest share. Over here in central point, we're going to find this little white, and so we're going to categorize this as white. But if we did largest share, actually most of the pixels made up of gold. That's why we're end up with this color over here. And so just keep in mind that also in rasters that you have raster generalization happening. So rasters data sets, and I'm saying this as a general rule, are very good for continuous data. So these are data sets that you measure. And a lot of times I like to think about this as data sets that are really uh, natural kind of phenomenon elevation amount of rainfall uh, wind speeds temperatures all these things are really good with continuous data uh, with, with raster uh, data sets um, not that you can't measure uh, uh, display discrete data sets you can just like how we were doing with the uh, with the the categorical here data discrete data sets are those that you count um, so you can see here that I'm still able to do it with raster, but the difference is is that uh, it's just better at continuous. I'm going to have all these null values around where a point line polygon might be better. Um, whenever we start going over to the vector data models, that's where I would say it's better for discrete data sets, things like roads, lines, uh, roads and uh, city points. These kind of things are usually I usually like to think man-made stuff is better. Um, we can also think about land use is also uh, okay to use with uh, discrete data sets and like soils uh, maps like the Sergo data sets from the USDA were, were always vectors and so you could see these kind of uh, vector data sets what they are look at polygons and so um, in vector GIS uh, everything is based off of points lines and polygons those three things and you can see uh, some of the bigger GIS names that are out there is like ArcMap, ArcView, the new ArcGIS Pro uh, and even some of these alternative things like Manifold or QGIS is you can call these vector GIS programs they handle rasters of course they can do a lot of things that the raster GIS's can do because now we kind of met this place where they kind of at a meeting point all these programs um, but in, in general, they're usually better uh, at uh, the arc view is better at lines, point lines, and polygons, for example, than um, ergos. Um, so, what are points? Here's our points. They're just uh, x, y coordinates in space. Um, whenever you take those x, y coordinates in space, you start connecting them together. You're going to get lines. Um, lines cannot don't have to be just two points. You can have multiple points. And whenever you start talking about that in line, you start calling them vertices. 
And so you can say one, two, three, four, make a whole bunch of points and connect them together and you can start getting pretty complex lines. Um, if you have that line reconnect at the very first point that you made, you can also make an area and that's a polygon. So what's interesting about this is that actually polygons are made up of lines that connect on each other and lines are actually made up of a series of points. So vector model is truly just a bunch of points, um, but we represent them differently. Uh, so when it comes to the computer, uh, it's, it's actually able to redraw these uh, and, and do a lot of interesting ge geometric calculations with them that you wouldn't you would have a much harder time doing with a uh, raster. Um, also, what's interesting about this is that you can just keep on zooming in and you're not going to have pixelation. So that's kind of cool. Um, so if you want to go back to our example, the reservoir and the highway, here's a vector representation of it. We have our vertices at the different uh, turning points of the, of the road. And so we can start drawing out this line or we can have this line here for the water. Um, for the uh, for the reservoir, and so you can see here we get you know, actually a better I think a better uh, view of what's going on here because this is more of a road network for example. Um, you could do a better the raster. Okay, let me be fair. In the raster we had it as a kind of a low resolution raster, and that's why it doesn't. That's why you're kind of missing out on some of the information that you're getting here in the vector. Moving on. <clears throat> Some history of ESRI's GIS software evolution. It started off with Arc Info and moved over to Arc View. Um, and, and at first, Arc Info was a very command line driven platform. Arc View was the graphic user interface. Those two things combined as they converged and made ArcGIS 8.9. Now we're moving on to ArcGIS 10. And now, we're even further along, we're going now into ArcGIS Pro. Each one of these iterations of ESRI software came with its own data format. So back in the 1980s, we had coverages, but then whenever we moved over to ArcView with the graphic user interfaces, we had shape files. Uh, and the shape files then now are kind of antiquated. We moved over to geodatabases, both personal and file geodatabases. And so we've had different data formats that are kind of like you can see, like the the go-to format for the different platforms. But what happens today is that we're actually using all the data formats. The coverages are a little bit harder to come by, of course, but um, shape files are still out there like crazy. And geodatabases, all different types of geodatabases are out there. And even now on top of everything, we should start throwing in KMLs and KMZs for all the OpenGIS uh, stuff, that because that's kind of the OpenGIS data standard. That's and but the KML is actually what the what Google Earth was uh, data format came off of, and so what you can see here is the this is what it looks like in our catalog. You have these kind of different icons that come up, point signs and polygons for the shape files. Okay, uh, you can see here the coverages have the same kind of deal, just yellow. Um, I'm telling you, it's going to be really rare that you find a coverage going on, but you're going to get you're going to see shape files. You're probably going to make shape files and see shape files often. Um, what you got to start moving towards is geodatabases. Here's geodatabases. It looks like a little can, right? That is it's supposed to be a stack of disks. And so um, kind of like what's in your hard drive. That's what that little icon is. And so this geodatabase became like the kind of gold standard of the data for, for ESRI. And you're seeing ArcGIS Pro. Basically, they move almost completely away from shapefiles and move directly to geodatabases. In Arc uh, GIS Desktop, you're still having the mix of shapefiles and geodatabases. And the what I usually say about shapefiles is that it's the kind of tried and true, always works, easy to, easier to support um, file format. But it has major limitations when it comes to amount of records you can store, speed and processing. And so if you're doing anything more complex than just making, you know, a simple map, you got to start moving over to geodatabases. Once you're in geodatabase, though, this is a whole new, the geodatabase format um, is, is much more powerful. You can do much more records, and 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 you can even do 64-bit processing, which you can't do with shape files. So um, if you are going to do something that's more intensively process-intensive, you're going to want to go with geodatabases. But what do shape files look like? So shape files uh, consist of a .shp file, but they also come with other... Uh, associated files .dbf .shp .shx, and each one of these associated files 
uh, store component of the shape file. So maybe the shape file itself is doing the geometry, but then the database file, DBF, is holding the database, the PRJ is holding your projection, and so forth, XML is holding your metadata. All these files come together and are actually one file. So the long story on this is never mess with your shape files in Windows Explorer. If you want to do something with your shape file, you have to do it in our catalog. You need to rename it, rename it in our catalog. You need to move it, move it in our catalog. Do not do it in Windows Explorer. You move one of these files, you break it. So you got to be careful. Also, if you're going to be emailing something to people uh, about uh, like a shape file, you would actually have to email them all of them for them to work. So you need to click them all, zip it, compress it, and send it off by email. So keep that in mind. So there's also two types of geodatabases. The newer type is the .gdb, the file geodatabase. That uh, has some advantages, especially when it comes to working with uh, enterprise systems and, and, and servers and so forth. Uh, and, the, and the older type is .mdb, a Microsoft database. This is uh, what you would use in Access. So uh, it's kind of cool that you can open up some of these personal geodatabases in Access. So you can see here a geodatabase, what it actually does is that it's a group of tables. It's kind of, it also stores in the feature classes, feature data sets, typology, and even geometric networks all in one uh, single uh, data management system. So it's, it's, it's the better way to do it when it comes to data. Uh, so if you're, trying, if you're on a big project and you keep on avoiding geodatabases, you're just gonna give yourself more problems in the end. If you're on a you know, one-off project, uh, you can start working with a bunch of shape files, but then you'll end up with a you know this kind of mess of files. Um, whenever you look inside of a geo database, uh, one of the cool things that you can start doing with them is that you can even store rasters in them. So it's kind of cool. And if it's an MDB, it's all showing up as one single file. So it kind of makes something that's a little bit more shareable. Um, you can store feature classes, tables, and annotations, of course. And here's what it looked like. So you have your your uh, disk there, and then within that disk, you have here all the feature data sets. Those are almost are you can say are like folders. So I can say my hydrologies, parking, whatever. And this look in public uh, utilities within public utilities folder. I have feature classes. So I'm going to have here uh, parcel polygon, water main, so forth. Points lines of polygons all being stored within public utilities. Um, a big uh, the thing about map documents. So in ArcGIS desktop, we have a map document. Say that's an MXD file. These are only really good for you. They're not something that you're supposed to go and share because they don't actually store the data. It only stores a link to the data. So they don't, they're, they're nice for you to save your settings, but they're not there for you to share. If you want to share, you need to start looking at map packages. So you make a map package and you share that out. Um, and also uh, another thing is, is that if you want to look at uh, making nice maps, we're going to talk a lot about this later with coordinate systems. But uh, there's there, GIS, GIS in general in, in the ESRI products is probably the one thing that they do the best is to handle with coordinate systems with their project on the fly. There's two types of coordinate systems out there, unprojected and projected. And in ESRI, they like call them the unprojected geographic coordinates. So geographic coordinates are unprojected. They're in only decimal degrees. They are the improper way to make a map. Never make a map in geographic coordinates. It's just not supposed to be done cartographically don't do it projected coordinates are the ones that you should be using to make maps and then you and there's a whole caveat of things that we'll talk about in another video about um, what you're supposed to do with projected uh, what how, how you choose which projection and so forth but in projection you're gonna have map units like in for example feet or meters and so if you look here this is an example of New York as being projected or unprojected which one is it what do you think I give you a chance to think about it. Uh, the first question you gotta ask yourself is, does it look ugly? If it looks ugly, then it's unprojected. No, I'm just joking, but it is ugly. But look at this. It's not looking the way that you would expect New York to look like. But if you look here where I have this big uh, circle, uh, it's in decimal degrees. So you remember the units I told you here? The units are in decimal degrees. So units are decimal degrees, unprojected. Do I make a map in this? No. Do I share my data in it? I mean, you can. A lot of people do share their data in unprojected NAT83, for example, North American Data 1983, or WGS84, World Geodetic System 1984. They'll share those in unprojected because then they're more platform, there's more platform interoperability. But if you want to make a map, then you're going to want to make it like this. So is this one projected or unprojected? 
easy projected why New York looks great, but also look over here at the units in meters. So just remember whenever you do start making final map outputs in GIS, you should always use projected.